good afternoon good evening good morning good night to everybody all over the world joining us today on the wfm community my name is amit malhotra the host of the show for a while uh, love the audience and love the speakers that we have uh, today uh, a very interesting subject i'm sure uh, we're trying to do our best to try to run as many interesting subjects as possible to ensure that we can actually add value uh, today's subject is uh, far more interesting uh, allow me a second it's about glare it's about managing glare it's about the whole aspect of glare as the glass comes by uh, there's a mirror mirror on the wall now the glass is on not just wall it's on the whole building and then you first you put the glass up and then you manage everything around it how's it's funny you manage the lighting on the facade you manage the fire on the facade then you manage the glare and then you can't do shit about the sun because he's on his own trip so what we have to do is to circumvent it uh we have a very interesting uh set of panelists uh, from pretty much around the world and i'd like to just uh, introduce them before i blabber continuously allow me to just put my screen so that i can share it and put everybody here if my system is working uh, a little bit before uh, it's our job to talk about wfm community it's the first of its kind community in the world uh bringing a platform where people can network architects builders developers consultants engineers architects product suppliers keeping about what's going on <clears throat> but personally for me the reason we built wfm is to actually tell everybody what not to do everybody knows what to do but here is the bigger point is what not to do and that's where we have these specialists who will be diplomatically correct but still will try to push them to say don't do this man and, and that's the way we want to drive it forward so uh the first on our panel is uh, alan ganier from saint gobain sage glass uh, as you can see pretty much he's been around in the market for pretty much a long time been around the world he's highly educated and coveted and i'm not going to talk about his being how educated but since being on the subject with the white hair that qualification enough that you've crossed uh, more education and really executed job so alan don't get me wrong for the white hair i have my strands i color no them worries. <laughs> uh we're then joined by bilaluddin ahmed uh, he heads the specifications at kenoff insulation uh, a name which probably everybody knows about and has been in the market and talking about insulation material we are also joined by bruno santos from kenoff insulation as well he covers the uae oman and pakistan we talk a lot more on energy saving as well as engineering design helping engineers and contractors for mep solutions in facades specifically then we have matthew uh muir uh, he's a director at dp facade i am sure everybody knows about dp facade uh, he's done projects all over the world so he would have a a global perspective i wish you knew corona was coming man <laughs> if you went all over the world <laughs> i wish but never mind i think it's been in a lot of ways a blessing a uh, lot of things we learned and unlearned during this time nikole and i'm not going to get into the last bit but i'll keep it to chenko and uh, he's the managing director of agc obikin glass uh, we've had the pleasure of doing an event with uh, agc a couple of weeks ago which was about the international women's day he's from the land of the the greatest uh, i wouldn't want to say mafia but yo bro we are with you and i think with so much learning from russia uh, brings together he's been in southeast asia and this part of the world for the longest time uh, and and then we have subray kalkura he just told me he's originally from bangalore so namaskara sir uh, sustainable design environment cardiff university so all the great and you must have seen as you came along while we were building the subject he's got also immense amount of experience and uh, he's an architect as well so we're going to learn so today's topic is managing glare noise and heat uh, it sounds like a lot very important especially when it was the the shutdown and every speck of noise could be heard so beautifully and you couldn't ignore it and when the shutdown happened there was no noise it was so peaceful and there were some homes or some buildings which were still making noise from inside and you realize the value of i think noise you value of heat and really by staying in the house the whole day long so having said that uh, i'm going to jump into the the questions and i'm going to be a little candid on this uh, subject here as to 
I'm going to start this with Alan. Why do people, when they know how to manage glare and the consultants and the developers, and they know that this glass, putting it in this direction could be a problem or putting this thing somewhere could be a problem. And still you beat around the bush, you end up with the same problem. The sun's not going to help you. You got to help yourself. So Alan, tell me, why do people not take this subject so seriously enough? That's a very important question. Uh, I think for us, uh, you know, glare management and, and heat management in the building is is, is very, very important. Uh, I, I think um, uh, people love to put glass in, 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 in their facades and in their curtain wall because they, they like the access to, to the outdoor, they like the view. Um, you know, in real estate, a view has a lot of value, you know. Uh, if, uh, if you buy an apartment, uh, um, you know, a, a sea view is not the same as a land view, you know, and, and, and so view to the, to the outdoors and view to the outside is very important. And as you said, you know, there is orientation and, and, and the sun is moving up there in the sky. And uh, if it's not managed well, then, uh, yeah, a lot of heat and glare enters your space and it makes it very uncomfortable. So that's why, you know, we as, as, as Sage Glass, part of the Saint-Gobain group, we offer, you know, dynamic glass solutions that uh, can regulate the amount of heat and glare that comes into the space by tinting electronically the glass. So um, yeah, we, we have solution and solution exists to, um, to help. Um, so why doesn't, glass. why doesn't everybody use your glass? That's my question, Alan. That's a very good question. You know, well, maybe I'm not doing my job well enough, um, <laughs> uh, but um, that's uh you know that's a possibility the other is that you know we have to create awareness you know that this is this is something that that uh, and there are other solutions obviously you know i'm not saying we are we are the only solution around so they, they, they are you know people shade buildings you know you can design a building with 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 shading elements with louvers with bristle you can use you know blinds and shades we don't like we don't like them you know we we say we always we are we are no bs you know no blinds or shades um, but um, yeah, there, there are many solutions out there to, to, to manage that. So we're not unique, but we are bringing something quite then, new to the And we're coming, we're coming to a point that there is a lack of awareness. Uh, what do you have to say about this, uh, Nicole, from your perspective? AGC, also in the similar line of business, what is your, what is your feel? My, my opinion would be that probably there is, a, there is enough of awareness, especially knowing that many products do exist for so many years already. Many of them are much more, much, much older than I am, actually. But uh, when we are approaching the, when, we, when it is about the design engineering of a nice, uh, sustainable building envelope, surely we, are, we have to discuss together with all the professionals, together with all players from our industry, the entire set of different parameters. We are talking about the unique feature of the glass, which is its transparency. But together with the day, day uh, with the daylight, we are getting the side effect, which is the the glare, which we have to control. We are talking about the appearance or the aesthetics of the glass. But sometimes we are forgetting that with the uh, high light reflection outside from the glass from the facade, we we are forgetting sometimes about the traffic safety. We are talking about, I don't know, the light, light reflection of the glass from inside. And we are forgetting sometimes for the residential building and for the commercial building, these requirements sometimes are different. It's not very nice sometimes during the um, evening time to see our nice bodies instead, instead of the skylight of the city. We are forgetting quite often about the major property actually of, the, of any building, which is the safety of its tenants. And it is about the defenestration. It is about other variations of, of safety. We are forgetting sometimes about uh, noise uh, insulation or acoustic protection. Again, that, that's what we're discussing. In massive uh, cities, surely the noise is, uh, is a major, major factor. Definitely, we have to think about so many different factors like we discussed before. It is about fire safety and many other aspects. And finally, again, for me, it should be a really a collaboration between different teams because when we are designing the nice facade, it is not only about the facade itself. It is about how this facade is animated with internal systems for the building, how the facade reflects, sorry, how the facade impacts the HVAC systems and many others. So again, this is exactly what we are trying to do. We are, we are trying to participate and to activate connections 
between different participants of the design, engineering, and construction process. So let, let me circle this. Thank you. Let me circle this to Matthew from an architectural engineering facade contractor point of view. As to, we all know, like he just mentioned, Nicole, that everybody knows there's a lot of awareness. Still, things don't happen the right way. There is a lot of noise. There is also glare and all the other factors associated. So you as a consultant, what's your take? You've been doing this for a while now. Things have improved. People listen to you better or they still tell you that you're just talking shit, bro. <laughs> it depends. Those who know me and have worked with me for a long time, they'll take my word for gospel, thankfully. Uh, but those who work uh, for the first time with me, they tend not to believe it. And, you know, you were asking why do people make mistakes? And I think it's it's a case of, uh, as uh, as Nikolai mentioned, the lack of awareness. And I, I can give you some, we said we would not name projects, so I would not give any projects where we had, you know, problems or we observed problems, but just a, a few simple things, you know, uh, to control heat in the past, what did people do? They used to use reflective glass, right? Because they thought, you know, you make the glass reflective, the, the light bounces back, so the heat must also bounce back somehow. There, there was some sort of a amalgamation of the two notions of heat and light as being the same thing. But in, in actual fact, you just um, reflect the light, you cut down the amount of light getting into the building, you cause potential problem with the traffic, like what Nikolai was mentioning. And at the same time, you don't solve the heat problem because heat is infrared, which is a different range of, of frequencies, and that still gets into the building. That's just one simple example. Tinted glass. You know, people like to use gray glass at the moment. You know, there was a blue period, there was a green period. At the moment, it's gray. Everybody wants gray glass. If you look at the spectrum of transmission of gray glass, it's probably the worst glass to use on any building. It's it's transmitting a lot of UV, it's transmitting a lot of infrared, and it transmits very little light. So basically, you you're 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 killing you're killing the HVAC system, you're killing the the mechanical systems uh, when it comes to to cooling the building. And so you, you need to look at it. Uh, you know, with science behind you. You know, you need to understand the science. You need to understand the material properties. You, you need to understand. You know, look at the building uh, as a whole as well. Um, I, you know, we've been talking about glass, of course, right now, but it's all the different materials that can make up the facade. You have to look at it as a whole and make a very conscious and informed decision. And this is where uh, the, the opinion or the technical advice from professionals like, like myself and, and, and others um, comes in handy because there is just so much to learn. You know, you, you said it, I've been in, in this industry for more than two decades and I'm still learning all the time. There's always new things coming up, new concepts, new systems, new products, new materials, new whatever, you know, and, and uh when let's say you're an engineer or an architect focusing on your structure or on your uh, the design of the building, you, 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 you have so many different things to think about without on top of that becoming a facade specialist. You know, that's, that's already a full-time job, you know, <laughs> and they're already doing one or two or three different full-time jobs as it is, you know, it, it, all, all the different parts of the buildings are complicated nowadays. And, um, so that, that's why it takes, uh, it takes a team in the end to make it work and it, it takes trust, it takes, uh, you know, understanding of different trades and what, what sort of impact one decision can have on the others as well. You're muted, Ami. I, I take this question to uh, uh, Subraya in terms of the architectural overview aspect again, same question. Yeah. Uh, perhaps with your experience of doing so many projects, pretty much, pretty much all over. Uh, yeah. Yes, Amit. I mean, I, I think to, to some extent, both Nikolai, Matthew, and and uh, uh, you know, they already touch touch based on this point. See, we as architects, when we design design any building, there is always conflicting requirements. You know, there is there's there's a requirement imposed by the client. And there's a requirement imposed by the site. You have view on one side, maybe you know your best views of your plot are on the western side. So you're, you're, you're kind of forced to have a glazed facade on the western side, uh, western south side, though it's not climatologically not the best side to have the transparent facade. So all I'm trying to say is 
buildings always have conflicting requirements, often imposed by the views, often imposed by the street view, often imposed by the client's requirements. So it's always a juggle for the architect to take into consideration various conflicting criteria and come up with a design which satisfies the client's requirement, which is also climatically responsive. So, and often these requirements can be conflicting. That's where probably we'll, we'll lead into what you're saying. Even though we know that that's not the best solution, there is an overriding criteria which actually shapes the building in a particular way where probably you lose the efficiency on the, say the thermal comfort or the noise criteria on a building. So I would say it's a conflicting criteria that the architects are challenged to work with, which sometimes results into uh, buildings with undesirable, um, uh, say, either uh, un undesirable, uh, say, performance of the buildings. So I think that's that's my view on that. Um, and, and moreover, uh, as I said, um, uh, and, and again, you know, see, the lack of understanding of the designer of the technical uh, requirement, that also often... Uh, kind of a leads probably into not very efficient building design in terms of the facade performance. See, like, you know, an architect start working with the design and if he integrates the requirement of the facade at the later stage of the building, probably he'll, he'll, uh, he'll end up having a, uh, not, a, not fully synchronized or he'll, he'll end up having an inefficient design. So one of the things that probably, which, is, which, is, which we should adopt is the, uh, so-called fully integrated design approach, where all stakeholders of the design, all designers, facade designers, the architect, the MEP engineer, the client, we all need to work together right from the early stages of the design. So integrated design approach could be one approach, which is generally, I mean, you know, that, that's the kind of a standard. But when you don't meet this requirement, that's where I think build, you know, we'll end up having buildings which are not as efficient as they could be in terms of uh, its thermal performance, noise criteria, or say, or, or the glare criteria. So I think, I think that, I would say that's my take. I, I, thanks, I'll, I'll leave this to Bilauddin and uh, to Bruno in terms of the properties which are very impertinent when it comes to uh, noise and sound insulation. Uh, see, I'll, I'll be agreeing with my industry colleagues that uh, the knowledge and uh, what uh, people are thinking right now in terms of what is the purpose of uh, the glass or the facades uh, is there, eh? is not being fulfilled by the people because of uh, the knowledge not being there. So the industry is changing and because of it is changing, others' the material has to also have a collaboration with it. Eh? So apart from the facades, the next second thing is uh, the insulation material, which provides the thermal and the acoustic values are more important or as important as the building facade material, which is to stop the glare and these things, because you need to stop the, the thermal leakage of it. And that's the most important thing as well. Also, we have double skin facades uh, and those are acting on it. But from floor to floor, uh, these uh, uh, thing has to be there to stop the leakage. And uh, uh, seeing the industry, how it has been changing, but the, still the practice has not been there. Been considering that we are in one of the world most uh, uh, best part in the Emirates uh, uh, for the building facade and architecture. But if you move to like 300 kilometers to the Saudi Arab market uh, or to any other market, there is still the knowledge has not been there. So that's uh, it hurting everyone. So like... Like I think uh, earlier, uh, what was mentioned, I think Nicole mentioned that the awareness is there, but awareness is very centered to a particular region where a lot of development has been done. So let's say for all the newer regions, like you mentioned about Saudi and other areas, what is it that is needed to be done? I'm sure I'm, all of you would agree. Uh, in fact, Bruno, you want to add something to what uh, your colleague just mentioned? Uh, yes, I will add to what my colleague mentioned, but also to expand on some of the points that Nikolai and all of the all of the, my my partners brought, is that uh, the integration between the HVAC systems and the facade. And uh, I'm raising this point to just expand on what Bilal said, because thermal performance has been studied and linked to an increase or decrease in the performance of, uh, let's say, any office worker. So if you talk about 
um, a temperature that's not controlled and uh, let's say it's too cold, too hot, 30 degrees, 15 degrees, it can lead and it has been studied and linked to a 10% decrease in productivity. So if we manage and if we compare all of this that we discussed to the actual economical impact on uh, the productivity of, of a company or the, the cost saving or the, the energy savings that are not there because of this, we can see that a proper integration between all the systems that includes facade, that includes thermal, uh, thermal resistance, that includes noise for criteria, glass criteria, will directly impact, and we have numbers to show that, the actual performance of the people that occupy. So if you talk about occupant comfort, this is one point to, that you need to think. And most of the times you don't see this awareness in, uh, I will not say the architects, I will not say the engineers, I will not say the, the people that design a building, but sometimes the operators or the developers are not thinking about all of these aspects. They think about the final product, how we're going to, to build this at a lower cost or the lowest cost, cost possible. But now we, we are coming now in 2021 and we need to think about the future generations. We need to think about how we can build in a more sustainable way and energy saving, reduction of noise, reduction of glare are means to achieve this. That's so my take on the, on the subject. What, what I've been able to understand from what everybody just uh, has around one is the fact that the importance is definitely there and I think it has a commercial advantage as well if you take care of glare uh, you cut down the heat you are able to do better air conditioning more efficient if the noise is less you have at least peaceful working environment to maybe enhance efficiency of people who work inside the building or live inside the building to have more peace so it has somewhere it has a tangible advantage and somewhere it has a commercial advantage if I'm not wrong so then to take this again I'm still going to stress about that everybody mentioned that there should be an interface, right? So there should there be a checklist of things to be done in a facade where noise, <clears throat> glare, and the other aspects should be considered. And there's a question out from somebody in the audience asking about now with all this building integrated photovoltaic solar, has it impacted the designing uh, of efficient facade uh, energy generation or help in reducing the glare and the heat? Could we start with Matthew again on this subject? Yeah, you know, I think the, the checklists are there. You know, um, um, uh, for instance, when, when we work on projects, one of the very first things we do is we, we actually have a roundtable discussion with all the different parties, uh, including the client, because they are the one paying for the building, um, you know, structural engineer, mechanical engineer, obviously the architect, the quantity surveyor, absolutely everyone. And we discussed all these items on the checklist, you know, because uh, as Bruno was saying just now, and as I mentioned briefly before, you know, you, you need that integration. You need to make sure that what you do will not adversely affect what the other person is doing and, uh, and that ultimately you come to the best possible solution for the project. And yes, you know, you, you do have, uh, so the, the, the checklist is there, but the, the, the problem I think is, um, first, it's probably an economic one. You know, the, the absolute best solution is generally not the cheapest or not even the middle of the road solution. It's generally the most expensive. It doesn't have to be. Uh, uh, let me say before someone jumps in and, you know, <laughs> beats me. But no, it doesn't have to be. But quite frequently, it ends up being the most expensive one. And that's not the one that most clients are happy to pay for because economy returns and ROIs and whatever, it just doesn't work for their business models. So it means you need to compromise. And if you achieve, let's say, a glare mitigation, maybe you'll have a problem with, I don't know, with heat, for example, or uh, if you want to cut a little bit of cost here and there, maybe acoustics will be a problem and it will be too noisy inside the space, which is another factor which can decrease productivity when you're constantly, um, you know, surrounded by, by heavy noises. So, uh, you know, in, in a way, I, I think people, you know, if you have a, a good team of professionals in the construction, everybody knows what to do to get a good building together. Um, but, yeah, you, you need to be able to spend that money. If not, you will have to, to compromise. And um, you, you need to... Uh, Keep an eye on the ball. You know, you need to make sure that, uh, uh, let's say, uh, you know, everybody's aware of what everybody else is doing. You know, the importance of coordination is is essential. To to some extent, you know, new uh, newish design methods like beam and 
whatever parametric design. I mean, you know, there's a bunch of different new tools that are available for the past whatever five years and ten years. And I mean, anyway, it's always, you know, when I when I started, I was doing every drawing by hand. You know, so <laughs> we've come a really really long way. <laughs> All the calculations by hand as well, and um, uh, you know, th these are just tools. You know, they they might make your life a little bit easier and or make it easier to work on more complicated projects but it's still down to individual decisions and and um, and, and uh, collaboration and coordination with the team members just want to add uh, thanks uh, matthew just take this question perhaps to alan next in terms of i just feel that uh, there is lack of documentation of case studies in the facade industry specifically to these subjects where data is not tabulated and available uh, to actually elaborate on a particular aspect of, let's say, solar heating or glare or noise, where case studies could actually be circulated around the industry of what to do and what happened in this project. Not that it was planned to be a failure. It was not planned at that time. Data was not available. But today with Dubai, let's say the UAE, for example, with almost, I think, 30 years of buildings with a ton load of glass and cladding, could, could that be a way forward, Alan, to be able to collaborate case studies and put this forward in trying to help people not to make the same mistakes again? Yeah, I mean, case studies are, are important and, and, and looking back at, at, at the past is, is an example are, are great. I think what, uh, you know, Mathieu and Bruno were saying, you know, um, um, glare, heat and noise are, you know, manifestation of uncomfort. So what we want with, is the comfort and the well-being of the building occupant. That may not always be the priority of the real estate developer. You know, um, his priority is, is to sell the space. Um, so that 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 uh, you know, at, at, and and built you know at, at the fastest possible way and and the cheapest way sometimes. So, um, and and then you were mentioning checklists, and those checklists do exist. You know, uh, they, they are you know the lead standard, the the well standard. You know, if if so that 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 comes back to regulation. You know, if a government says. All the building in my, you know, jurisdiction have to be lead gold or platinum. Well, you know, tomorrow that will change the face of our industry. Um, but but there are economic consequences of that. You know that that will increase significantly the, the, the cost of building, and investors and again real estate developers will not be very happy. Um, so 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 there are trade offs between all of that so for me the case studies exist the, uh, the 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 checklist exists it's just it's just a drive you know if, if you look at some of the we were talking about energy consumption in buildings you know um what, what when you buy when you buy an appliance today you look at the label and there's a label on your fridge saying it's classified a b c d e uh in terms of energy consumption right, right. and now that they have put they, they have put it a plus and a plus plus and if your fridge is not A plus plus, you're not. Nobody is buying it anymore. You know, have you seen any B fridge in terms of energy consumption? Well, just put the same on all the buildings, and 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 you see that happening in in, in some European countries. And what they say is, you know, if your building is classified at the bottom F, E, G, then you are not as a as a as a building owner, you are not allowed to rent it anymore. So you have to do something. You have to improve it, the, the you know the insulation, whether it's it's yeah insulation, better insulation, better glass, better aluminium, better cladding. You have to do something about it, and um, you know they, they they touch you know building owners where it hurts on their you know on the money side, and 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 you do something about it. So that that's probably the the only way. You know it's 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 coming from regulation and and from yeah from governments to impose yeah. rules. Uh -huh. I'll add an example uh, with an experience of mine during uh, a trip to Shanghai way back in 2003 or 4. And we were driving from Shanghai city to the Pudong International Airport, which was just very new. And there were lots of lights across the road. Uh, and I asked one of my colleagues there, I said, dude, there's a lot of light. Do anybody occupy these buildings? And he said, no, they've all left these buildings. So I said, okay, why is that? He said, when you come back next time, I'll tell you. So anyways, I was pretty curious and I used to travel quite often. So I, I'll be fast on the story. So I went back next time and said, dude, what happened? 
he said all these buildings are on the extremely busiest highway which is driving to pudong they are all using single glass probably just happened and most of the tenants who came were all multinationals because they wanted to be on the road which leads up to the pudong airport it's almost a 40 km stretch and now there are more highways and if you've been to shanghai there's one express way over the other and most of the tenants from those buildings left i do remember without naming any client and i was in india and i was telling a client the story that if you want you still have a rent building to be rented out after 10 years you better do the first thing first today rather than trying to have a building which has no occupant in 10 years time and uh, i'm happy to tell you that that client actually listened and then all the buildings that they made thereafter had laminated through insulated safety glass this is from a perspective of noise but some people do listen if we are able to educate them correctly in terms of the future commercial loss if you have a 10 year of tenancy it's not going to pay back the building cost probably going to pay back a little while longer so taking that exactly. to the to the to the question uh, i would i would ask uh, probably this uh, nikola in terms of any development with building integrated uh, photovoltaics has impacted this designing for efficient facade uh, energy generation has it plugged in to play exactly i mean uh, i cannot say that it's a major trend but surely we do see an interest from the construction society to gipvs and definitely we are also we are not just a supplier we are also the team of engineers we are trying to support engineers and architects in into into bringing some new ideas and technologies to their creations which is working which is working well and sometimes it is working in some places which are pretty unexpected to have to use these technologies huh? we have uh, big projects right now somewhere in lagos in nigeria which is full of uh, glass integrated photovoltaics and this is amazing the only thing is that reflecting on the previous conversation i would like to say a few things so number one to protect our design engineering society in many diff- in many cases we see a huge gap between the design and design and the final realization and definitely it is because of so many different uh, things involved financial things mostly and definitely we do see that um, uh, sometimes it is just not a priority i all re- i honestly hate the word value engineering which has got a very good very powerful meaning but in our time or maybe our world right now it is being transferred into something different it is uh, cost stripping or uh, you know uh, cost redu- reduction but it is not value engineering any longer the, the one good example of value engineering was uh, and it is actually a project of 2007 when we came to the client as a big uh, group of different engineers and and and, and consultants and we said dear consultant please uh, dear, sorry dear dear developer we would like to ask you to pay 3 million euros more for your huge building for your huge facade and this this 3 million, million euros we would like you to ask you to invest into the facade but but as the um, as the result of this investment we will save you immediately 18 million euros on hvc systems plus some savings on the capex sorry on the opex and this is exactly the value engineering and it happened again in 2007 since then so many things have changed uh, hardware is absolutely on a different level software packages um, are also allowing us to to run very very complicated simulations and studies to predict what will be the the the, the temperature in that particular corner and what would be the i don't know co2 concentration in in, in this in this particular corner which is very very important through all these methods of thermal modeling heat transfer analysis so many different other things we have to demonstrate to the developer what he or she can win if they use this this um, or other technical solution and one more thing is that it is about the standardization matthew and alan reflected on this yes we have standards we have a nice regulation but sometimes these standards are just a copy paste from other countries where the climatic conditions are not matching the local ones and this is exactly the issue everybody can explain how thermal insulation what is the u value for the cold, cold cold climate conditions but ask so many people nobody can explain how does this thing work and how efficient it is to ask for lower u value in the hot in, in the hot climates so this is exactly it is not a rocket science we are able to calculate everything our society of designers and engineers are able to give very precise answers on this but probably developers real estate uh, companies they have to listen to us more no, because they can really benefit 
I think uh, without uh, trying to be any disrespectful to any of our developer friends, sometimes uh, we feel that they are wearing headphones all the time <laughs> and not really listening. What about you, uh, Subraya? What is your opinion on this matter of commercial value engineering? Yeah, co- yeah, th- yeah. I mean, architects, designers, and this value engineering, we hate this term, but uh, obviously we call it as these days, you know, the better frame is value management because, you know, they don't want to upset us, the, you know, design community with the term value engineering. So they say value management, you know, so that intensity of that word can be, you know, managed a bit better. But yeah, I mean, you know, that that's one area. It always, um, uh, at the end, for the value management or value engineering, the, the criteria should be set properly. Why are you value engineering? It's it's okay. If, if you're reducing the cost, what's the impact on the other aspect? So it's important to actually determine the criteria for value management and, and cost should be uh, cost shouldn't be the only criteria. That's what I would say when it comes to value management. But I actually want to pick up a little bit on the earlier uh, topic that you uh, uh, you touched upon, Amit, on the lack of uh, data and research. And actually, Nikolai also, to some extent, addressed that. See, um, uh, when I did my master's a few years uh, back, which I did from a local university over here, and I, I, I picked a master's in sustainable design, and one thing I did notice that all the publications generally in the energy which are done in Western world are slightly use a different criteria. All, all the publications are generally focused more about, um, you know, the heat gain rather than heat loss. But we actually, if you see the climate in which we work, the Middle East, India, and in this particular belt, we are more talking about how to avoid heat entering into the building and how to, how to kind of, uh, uh, manage heat losses better way. So it's slightly different criteria. And I kind of agree that, you know, there is not adequate research material on, 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 on that particular aspect. And I do, I, and I want to say that, you know, some of the local universities over here are doing some excellent work. Uh, I, I know that the students from British University who were based over here and certain other university, they, I, I see some more publications coming on this, which is, which is actually an important development. On this, I mean, you have uh, Mazdar University over here, Mazdar as an energy center over here, they focus on this. And I think eventually we are building a knowledge which is actually relevant to this area. Slowly but steadily, that process is happening. And I think it, it has to happen more so that the industry can gather um, the, the relevant information from the research which is, which is relevant to this area. I think that's a very valid point uh, in terms of research. Because I, I, you know, while we've been doing these events over the last year, we realized that uh, across different facets that we've covered from fire to facade lighting, to noise pollution, to light, to glare, to bazaar. And I think uh, one of you mentioned about uh, BIM, parametric design and so on. And I think it's uh, the use of software in trying to uh, simulate what can actually help in a building going forward in time will help. So I think with that, uh, I think what what was talking about value management, value engineering or whatever, it's simply saying spend now and save later. But the other way is usually happened, save now and want to save later forever. That doesn't happen. But the aspiration is always there, okay, we save now and we save forever. I think to do it right, the first time, if you spend 20% more, you'll get it right. But to do it not right, the next time you'll have to pay twice as much. I think that's what experience has taught all of us just to add to this point of noise insulation um, our friends from Kanof, uh, Bilauddin and what Bruno what would you like to share in terms of your experience of helping and advising our uh, community of designers developers what is it that they should really be looking at from a noise uh, perspective uh, see, uh, oh, sorry <laughs> Bilal, okay, you can go ahead please thank you uh, see, the product uh, which we as a manufacturer designed uh, is in accordance uh, to the specification or the local requirement and these things. And uh, the local requirement uh, is being cut, copy, paste from a European country and uh, from other, other areas as well also. Okay. So we need to understand the purpose where we are using uh, uh, the acoustical insulation to reduce the sound either is from the building facade exterior from the coming outside or from the inside. 
So the insulation over there is to be designed in accordance to that only. So we, as the manufacturers, uh, tell to the clients and to the consultants and to the architects uh, to use it uh, onto the specific areas that uh, the other floor person should not start listening to your conversation or there should not be any type of uh, leakage or anything or barriers should be there that uh, from the road itself you are uh, listening to the cars and uh, horns every time. So it's just not the building facade which has to play for the acoustic but also onto the road itself also. If you go into any European countries all the motorways and the highways are being covered with the sound barriers uh, to avoid the acoustics. Uh, it gives a very bad uh, experience in terms of viewing it. You have a big line of chain on uh, the sound barriers, but it do make people comfortable. So people can have a better living. So both of the things have to be integrated together to serve. And as others say that the client doesn't want it, uh, the person who's spending the money, he wanted to be more beautiful, to have more scenery on it. So it is difficult, but still there are materials who have better in terms of performance and in terms of uh, giving better material with the better values. Bruno, if you want to add something. Uh, yes, I, I think the, I think that's, that's a very good point, Bilal. Thank you. I also want to, to just expand a little bit on that term that we all, all of us hate from architects to suppliers, so value engineering, let's say, or value stripping, as Nikolai was saying, which is a very, very good point because um, sometimes you see, and this is why we as a community, and we have a panel here of uh, glass manufacturers and suppliers, we have architects here, we have engineers here, and we have to work together to try to educate the final users, so the developer, on why value, value engineering or value stripping is not a good idea because sometimes it is done while affecting safety parameters. And I've seen this, especially in HVAC systems, that uh, sometimes the fire safety properties of the material that is, that is put there is not as well thought of as in facade. But we have to think about the building as a whole. We cannot just think about this is a facade, so it needs to cover one thing. And then you have uh, buildings that you need to cover another thing. We all need to, be, to build efficient, to design efficient buildings. And it needs to, to start with us educating the developers and the clients because we know, all know that the ROI is very important and they will, they will see what is the best way to just uh, save on this and save now to not instead of saving later. But you need to also try to, to change this. The regulations are already set forth, although as a checklist, we can say it's not efficient enough for our region. So this is where our work starts. And of course, check, the checklist and regulations are just a tool and the tools just help you, but they do not replace your job. So we need also to work on this as a community, as a, as a panel, we are here. I think we can all represent a little bit of everything that is being done. So I can start working on that direction. And we should. Thanks, Bruno. I, I think one of the things that I've just come to kind of realize as a community platform that we are is to actually take help from Subraya. I just mentioned about the Mazdar University, and I'm sure there's enough research. If there is not, we will arrange for research to be done to pick up case studies to... Uh, I think just from a moralistic standpoint, somebody has to do this job in trying to put up a case study because you can't just copy paste a building from one area to the other because of sunlight, noise, the road and the future. Uh, God knows there's an airport next door to your building in five years time, right? So then here you go. So having having said that, I'm going to take one, I'm going to just put one question to all of you and you can... I mean, maybe, much, maybe before uh, if we ask a question... I, I can give you a very practical yes, example of what you just mentioned and what Bruno and Nikolai mentioned before as well, we, I, and, and Subraya, obviously. Uh, very, very simple example because we're, we're talking big ideas, but let, let's, let's look at something super simple that nobody should get wrong. It's where, which side of a wall you put the insulation and where you put the vapor barrier. Something very simple. All of us know from our daily experience from the time we're kids, Cold surface, we blow hot air, you get condensation, right? So what do you want to do? You don't want the cold surface or you don't want the hot air. And better if you, uh, if, if you have the two together, it's even better. And um, I, I recall a few years back, I was asked to investigate a wall where they were having fungus and algae growing and it was a disaster. It was saturated with water. You know, you use a, a protimeter on the wall and you read 99.9% .9 humidity. And... Um, what happened, it was a Swiss architect who had 
copied pasted their details from Switzerland, cold country, to tropical Singapore. And <laughs> the insulation was on the wrong side. It was on the outside of the wall. Very cold insulation on the inside. It was a commercial building, 24-7 air conditioning. And it got saturated with, with interstitial condensation, as we call it. It was wet. The walls were, were wet all the time. And it was a, a massive, massive lawsuit. They had to strip the, the entire facade and redo it. And, you know, at, at the moment, I, I just realized we're working on six continents at the moment. We have to be very, 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 very conscious of that. You know, we work from Canada, New Zealand, Peru, Singapore, uh, Qatar, so UAE. You know, it's... It's so, so important. And you can mess up something so simple and it kills the whole project. So simple. So um, when, when you think something so simple can be missed out, you start talking about glare and heat and More noise high. and all that. It's so much easier to screw up. <laughs> there are a lot of examples of this uh, things being screwed up for very small particular thing. So and it is dangerous as well also. And uh, when you're connecting the dots, way the the applicator or uh, the contractor or the designer has made a mistake. So the overall uh, discovering of it is very difficult. So when you're having a noise in the room itself, uh, either you can have the noise from the next adjacent room or from a drywall system or any other thing. And the people say, no, it is coming from the outside of the road or you're having a buzz sound every time from the air conditioning. So it is overall. And uh, this thing, if it has been placed wrongly at one particular point, then uh, it is making the difficulty for everyone. So people uh, lose money, lots of money on it. The point, the point here is, as, as I think Matthew mentioned, is the basics, the brass tacks. Yeah. And uh, everybody, I don't, we don't want to judge, but everybody thinks he's smarter than the other person. I think that's one of the greatest problems in any industry where two doctors don't look to each other, two consultants don't look to each other. And no offense. I mean, this is the way it works, right? Mm. Everybody has to. So my, my question was, and thank you, Matthew, for budging in on that. I think you said it right. I want to give this opportunity and a platform to everyone and probably start with Sobraya this time to have a closing remark in terms of what would you request your fellow community and the customers to keep into consideration when we're talking specific to this subject. Uh, more humanity, more consciousness, more uh, awareness in terms of what not to do. And that question is for all of you. What's the message that you would, with your 20 plus years of experience, all of you, most of you have, what would you like to say with respect to the subject that we're talking today? What is it that please, please, please don't do? Or please do it right. I think, you know, this sticks to basic. I mean, you know, the common sense prevails at the end of the day. So, you know, make sure that I mean, you know, for architects, when design, it could be like, you know, do the fundamental things right. Don't go at, get wrong with your building orientation. Don't have the biggest opening on the south or the, or the west side. As long as you do the basics right, you actually avoid a lot of future mistakes. Don't give a situation to a facade designer, which he, which he, he has to spend millions or a lot of effort to fix. If the design, as a designer, if you do the fundamentals right, Actually, it actually becomes a lot more easier for the engineers to do their bit right. So, so I'm actually going probably back to my initial point, collaborative design approach, that's the key, and doing the basic things right. I mean, you know, uh, so that, you know, uh, the, yeah, I mean, uh, you can avoid the big mistakes if you do the simple things right. That's all I would say. What about you, uh, Nicola? What would you like to say from a perspective of glass per se? From my side, we have, we all have a unique knowledge. Maybe it is very narrow, very focused knowledge, but it is a unique knowledge. And the collaboration or communication between different participants of the, of the building process is absolutely essential. And this is exactly what I'm always asking uh, everybody, all our uh, peers, all the, all the participants, uh, to invite engineers, to invite um, uh, consultants, to invite suppliers as soon as possible, very early stages of the process, of the, of the design and engineering process, because the cost of rectification of mistakes is significantly lower when you catch all these minor mistakes, with, like okay. Matthew is saying, in the very, very beginning. If, uh, if the consultant, a wise consultant as, and a supplier recommends a proper solution for the, for the case of Matthew in the very early stage, 
it will cost peanuts. I mean, just you know, to, to, to redesign some papers and so on. But I believe that they spend a fortune to rectify the mistake when it is was when it was too late. Uh, so that's the the message for our society, construction society. Alan, would you like to support the same statement? Would you like to add something to that? Yeah, I mean, my message would be, um, you know, to all of us, and and is is think about the occupants. You know, if you design a school. Think of the pupils and the teacher that will be, you know, teaching and learning there. If, if you design a residential building or villa, think of, you know, the family that will live there. If, if, if you design a hospital, think of the doctors, the nurses and, and that will work there and the patients that will, you know, be treated there. So um, that, that, that my, that, that's my message, you know, be people centric. Think of the building occupants and, and of the, you know, the users of, of that space and of that building. And, and, and if you apply common sense to that, and, and if you design it for yourself, uh, as if it's your family going to live there, or if it's your children going to, be, going to be taught there, then I think a lot of those mistakes will be avoided and, and everybody will be much happier. But just to add on to your, uh, Alan, thought is I say that please, please, whatever you do in your life, please put good karma. Because if you put bad karma right. it'll come to you, it will come to you one point of time in your life. And then that... Right. Goes, call it, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, Whether I'm, you call it karma or you call it feng shui or you call it, yeah. you know, whatever you call it. But but yeah, think about that. That's good. I That's say, good. I say, and I think Bilaldin and, and Bruno would be happy when I say this, that when, when you can hear what the room next door is bitching about you, at least you know what they're bitching. That's the positive side, but that's not the objective. And then you say, what the hell? How did we know? That's where importance is, where the karma comes in that, you know, whatever we do in our lives, we know a lot. And I think sharing is all about uh, what we do in our lives and the more we can share the more and i think what i think what matthew spurred the point of karma by saying that do the basics right and everybody knows the basics but everybody tries to circumvent it maybe sometimes many times uh, any last pointers from you bruno or uh, bilaudin uh, one more thing i just need to add uh, like put people first is uh, very much important but we need to think what will happen after 50 years Correct. when the building life cycle has been completed and the thing has been done, damaged, a lot of population, overcrowding and many things will be there. So what will happen? So we need to think and discuss, collaborate with the people what will happen after 50 years for this particular building. So this is uh, what I feel as one of the most important questions, uh, what will happen uh, next? <laughs> So this is where our whole holistic design approach uh, is being catered to. And I believe everyone, Matthews, Nikolai, or Alan, uh, every time in any uh, presentation or anything, uh, this question is going to come up or is happening. Uh, what will happen after this life cycle of that particular building? So th there's one question which has come up uh, from the audience. There have been quite a few actually, but I want to take this one, which is an interesting one. Any one of you can jump in to answer. When you work for developers, not users of the building in countries where there are scarce regulations, how do you manage to take the right decisions in terms of comfort, safety, and wellness? So the question is, there are pretty much no regulations. And how do you ensure the safety and comfort? And how do you work with those developers who don't care about uh, the specifications or the regulations? Maybe I can show Anyone? if you want. Um... You know, uh, it, it happens on quite, quite a lot. You know, when we work, for example, in, in South America, there are no real guidelines in a lot of these countries or in, in some African countries where we work. You, you may not have regulations. And then it becomes a case of establishing what is the best practice, what is the best reference you can take. Um, when, when it comes to glare, I think that's generally, uh, you know, there's a lot of technical documentation on that and there's um, guidance that you can take from these studies. Uh, noise, I think these are things that you can apply throughout. Safety, I think it's it's also something that, you know, you, you know, if let's say there's no design standard or there's no design guideline in the country, you can always revert to Eurocode or British standard or uh, the, the American uh, ASTM or other uh, standards that you can uh, take as a reference um, and 
the, probably the only difficulty is to see whether these need to be adapted in some ways as, as what we've said just now, um, whether, you know, guidance on insulation, for example, makes sense or not, or, or uh, guidance on light transmission, for example, this is commonly uh, something that's wrong when it comes to glass. You know, uh, if you work in temperate countries, you try to maximize daylight and you don't really care too much about G value. I'm simplifying, but you know, we, we are short of time, uh, short on time. And so you're in the tropics, you kind of want to do the other way around. You know, you want to cut down because otherwise everybody's going to put down the blinds and you're just, it doesn't matter that you have glass because nobody can see outside anyway. Uh, so uh, I think it's it's trying to bring across the experience that you have from either neighboring countries or similar climates or similar environments and try and see what is relevant and applicable to that particular location. I think that, that pretty much said there is enough experience paradigm available from different parts of the world. One only has to just reach out. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to thank all of you to be to have been a part of this uh, I think this has become more a spiritual one where we are trying to teach karma and we're trying to say, do it right, to be humane. And I think very rightly said that look at the human occupants who are going to be in that building as a prima facie. And I think what mentioned by by uh, Bilauddin and Bruno is the fact of sustainability and tomorrow recyclability after 50 years. So you got to do a full life cycle. It's the, it's the case of Benjamin Button that you start off as, a, as an old and die as a kid. And I think that's very holistically important from all the, the business aspects. Uh, we will circle back with you in the next six months and see what after effects of Corona and then what happens with buildings. And I'll take the opportunity to request all of you to participate in case studies that we will take up in seeing if we can spread more awareness and see to take more positive examples or examples which haven't been done right to at least educate uh, the community around us and wherever the more developments are happening. With that, thank you very much, uh, all of you, for joining in.